because we met over the summer for the first time. He doesn't really talk about all the fabulous things that he does, but we met uh, at uh, two events downtown where he was courting the Asian community to come over to the Republican Party. And uh, you actually told a very funny story that day about you and Trump, how you were trying to get Trump to run for something. For governor. Yes. <laughs> and he chose 2014. <laughs> <laughs> he always he reminds me, isn't it a great thing I didn't run for governor? <laughs> I was already running, so I can't give you the credit. But you spoke about how Trump wanted women in the Congress, and uh, you made the party very diverse. You sort of opened it up. You welcomed everybody. And I just see great leadership and great things under your tutelage. So thank you so much. We're really honored to have you. The 10th district, by the way, she is running as Jerry Nadler. Come on. Being a giant killer. Yes. Uh, giant in many ways. Yes. <laughs> I'm a little bit uh, taller than Bloomberg, but. <laughs> 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 Arms are too I'm short. I'm Henry Reese Colgan. I'm the former district leader of Harlem. Um, I came late. I apologize, but my D train was stopped because a gentleman was taking care of a woman who was being harassed by three thugs. Um. And and they jumped on him, beat him up, knocked me back, and I'm here. <laughs> My birthday's March 4th. I'm already going to Cuomo's office to let him know that you're not taking my real estate broker's commission that he just decided to do three weeks ago. Right. <laughs> But the main reason I got up is that I want to introduce my friend who was going to move to Florida. And I said, do you want to move or you want to fight? So she's running for the 13th Congressional District. Love Lynn Gwynn. She will win. About three weeks ago, I called her up and I said, I think I want to move to Florida. You gotta help me unwind all my real estate. I'm getting the hell out of here. So, I'm a fighter. You can fight. Why don't you go out for Congress? Okay, I don't know if you want to be a politician. Just, I'll help you. So, here I am, actually, officially today. Um, I'm live on the FEC.gov. Um, they filed paperwork, press enter, and I am good for go. I, um, I, I ran new. Any advice you could give someone like me who's never run for politics? I'm a small business woman. I've been in Harlem for 20 years. I've been in New York for 30 years. Uh, what I'm seeing is we're going backwards, and that was part of the reason why I wanted to really get out. But now I'm going to stay and fight. So what, what advice do you have for somebody like me, who's new and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate? You're going to have people every day to tell you you can't win. You're going to have people every day to tell you that you shouldn't bother. Fight like hell every day. Yeah. <laughs> Because we need people like you in the Congress. We need people like you that are willing to stand up and be heard and are not intimidated by the numbers. You're not intimidated by, you know, what, what's the worst thing that can happen? You lose and you run again. You're going to fight for your core convictions, your values, and everything that made you a Republican. Thank you for standing up and Yes, bravo. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Vanessa Simon. Thank Just one of many of you are aware, I'm probably going to talk about millennials in the future, <laughs> generation of Republicans. And it is important, and that's why I'm up here and speaking to you. Um, I do want to know, what are our plans for our party? Because you said at the end of this decade, we definitely want to expand diversity in more women voters, youth voters, all of the above. Especially when you have young Republicans, proud patriots since the age of 18, the tower is raised, I stand on it, as well as Gavin. We have Gavin Wax, Yehuda Goatsfield, Anastasia Hagen. Like, we are all passionate about the future of our country. What is our plan to continue to galvanize and in, engage those youth voters that will, it's like an unsigned margin. You can no longer be like, ugh, Bernie's got them. What are we doing to fight to get them back? Well, let me, uh, 
Let me start with this. I mean, obviously, as Dan read my biography, I'm the youngest guy ever to have this job. <laughs> By a lot. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I, I was 38 when elected, I'm 39 now. I represented generational change in this party. And I'm glad I won the election in the fashion that I did, which is I went and traveled county by county and met this party in its backyard. I didn't just listen to what people told me when they came to Albany for a big meeting or at the convention, because everybody brags and pounds their chest about how great they're doing. I got to see under the hood, okay? I got to diagnose a lot of problems by traveling to these county organizations, to see the campaigns up close, to see how elderly and decrepit our party is. Mm -hmm. Got a long way to go. And I'm very aware of Gavin Wax and the great work he's doing with the Manhattan New York Woo! Bravo! Bravo! I see the social media and all the wood and the pictures and the crowds, and I see he's getting something right. Yeah. And it's, uh, I, I look at this as, 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 as um, kind of a, a simple attitude change that has to happen. And it's one, an edict that I put down on county leaders across the state. You, got, you can't just say, oh, well these are these young Republicans that sit over here in this box, okay? And they're, they're good people, they're gonna do all our work <laughs> while we just sit over here and make the decisions. You got, and, and the same goes for women's involvement. Well, this is our little ladies club. And they lick the envelopes, and they sit over here. <laughs> and we're gonna sit here, and we're gonna make the decisions. <laughs> and we're just gonna sit here on high and make all the big picture decisions, and they're gonna lick the envelopes, and they're gonna knock on the door. And I'm gonna sit here and just be fat and happy in the middle. <laughs> that is not the way to run a political party. <laughs> you empower people, and include them. And you make young people leaders in our party. And you make women's organizations part of the fabric of our party. And, and that goes the same thing with our, our minority outreach efforts and all of that. It has to be all people at the table as equals. And, and, and you've got some leaders that won't let that happen because they're afraid of losing control. But if the day that I have to sit here and be petrified of staying state chairman um, is the day I'll leave as chairman. Mm. Because it is, to make real change, you have to add, not subtract. Yeah, correct. We are outnumbered by the left. They have all the money. They have the unions. They have the media. And, you know, they have a lot of idealistic young people that don't quite get it yet. They won't until they really pay serious taxes. Um, and, or maybe they have children of their own and understand what impact this has on people's lives. But I think it's more by action. And I, and I hope that in my administration, we will be showing that action in real time. I know uh, Saturday night, I'm breaking away from the family again and traveling out to Cooperstown to address the New York State Young Republican Dinner. And we're going to give the state young Republicans and the state college Republicans and the state federation of Republican women permanent seats on the state executive committees. Okay. Because it is about showing by example. Now, what does that cost us to do? Nothing. What impact does it change on probably the outcome of any vote? Nothing. But it does show symbolism. And uh, it's just like showing up places. I mean, we talked about it, you know, one of the candidates was talking about the time I, I was in Chinatown. And it, it, it's about showing up and delivering. We're from the Republican Party, and we want you to belong to our party. That's right, absolutely. And putting that love in we, we have to be successful in this state. We have to blow the doors wide open to people of all party affiliations and say, the Republican Party welcomes you. You know, whether, if you feel you've been alienated by their socialist, out of control policies in Albany and New York City and even in the House of Representatives, then the Republican Party welcomes you to join our ranks. We don't make everybody wear a MAGA hat. <laughs> if you want one, I have one for you. <laughs> you're welcome here. And if, you're, if you want to join our effort to fight back and take back our state, then join our cause.
as Carl Rove, former chief of staff to George W. said, we have to empower the youth so that we can help join the fight and speak in the same rhetoric out there. We've got to add and not subtract. So thank you so much. I've been doing this in one way or another since, uh, as, you, as you read my, my story when, before I came up here, I was a kid in Sarah College Republican chapter on campus just because I was going to I had never been involved in a campaign in my life, and I was inspired, and I had to look back. You know, I, I can look at any staff that works for me and say, I've done every job in the place. And it's, uh, this job I have now, I, I kind of consider I'm the head coach and general manager of the team. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to recruit the candidates, players, you know, you have to, you know, maybe write the playbook, make sure it's being executed, and you make sure you have the resources to get the job done. And we're trying to do all of that, but it's like drinking out of a fire hose. Change comes slow. Uh, I try to step on the gas, you know, pretty hard to, to, to get us moving in the right direction. And I think we're starting that. That, that culture change has emerged. How are you, Jefferson? Yeah, how are you doing? Good to see you. Nice to see you, Jeff Merrill. Thank you. Um, I just, I moved up here in 1969 from New Orleans, and so I got spoiled with the Senate being Republican. We just took it for granted way back. Oh, I hate to say it that way, but we didn't expect to lose it. So my question is, are three pronged if you don't mind. One of them is, what could you give us your version sometime or tonight of what happened for losing the Senate? Because I've heard it from other sources. What happened? I know the vote was incredibly out went, went out for the Democrats, numbers of people. Uh, the second is, um, I'm thinking, uh, what what can we do differently, or what can we try to do to get those 13 plus seats that we need to get back again? That's going to be a long haul, I think, Nick. I don't know when that's going to happen. But I'd like to know what your plans are in that, in that direction. And the last thing, I was just thinking while I was standing here, those people leaving New York, how many of those are Republicans? Does anybody ever think about that? A disproportionate number. Or at least yeah. conservative yeah. Democrats that would switch their vote back and forth. Um, you, you bring up very good questions, Jefferson. It, 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 as you look at what happened in 2018, I mean, it's not really there's no real blame assigned to, to any one person. This is a midterm election of the presidential administration. I mean, we saw they had energy because they can't accept the fact that President Trump won in 2016. And that, that energy uh, had, had festered. And I, and I kind of likened it to like uh, an old radiator system where there's a lot of pressure in the pipes, okay? You had to have a ball off. And they were so angry and they just wanted to lash out at the president so badly. And 2018, they, they left pressure out of the pipes. And Democrats came out with much more gusto than Republicans did. I mean, we turned out an okay vote, but nothing like the Democrats did. They, they so far exceeded our ability to raise funds in races across the nation. At Blue was a tool where people were like, I don't even give a damn where the money goes. Just send the money, you guys decide where to send it just to take back the House of Representatives. Because a lot of these people were voting for impeachment with their wallet. I mean, they wanted the impeachment. They, didn't, they would stop at nothing short of that. Um, that swallowed up the New York State Senate. Now, I, I think there was antiquated campaigning going on. Uh, I talked to uh, a gentleman that was very senior in the campaign team um, Saturday before Election Day. I asked, how are we looking? And he says, oh, we're finding all but one, all but one seat. And I kind of had an uneasy feeling about that, because I, I didn't feel that that would be the case, because you saw the disparity in funding. The governor had come out and finally said he wanted a Democratic Senate. It was all working uh, in tandem. Uh, and then I tell you, where I saw we were probably toast was looking at footage from New York One uh, the line around the block on Staten Island, outside of Max Rhodes headquarters, where people came from all over the city on the ferry and you know they drove in just to campaign for something that would hurt Trump. And I mean, there was literally a block all the way or a line all the way down the block and around the block to people to just go get a packet of flyers to distribute door to door. Uh, like, we're in trouble. I mean, you just see that energy, that enthusiasm. Much like 2016, they didn't see coming when we were filling arenas up all over America for President Trump. 
I mean, I sat with my counterpart in Erie County when I was still county chairman uh, shortly after the presidential election. And he was just still so dumbfounded. And he just said, did you see it coming? And I said, you yourself told me that earlier this year you were circulating petitions with your name on them for delegate to the National Democratic Convention in your hometown that you've lived your whole life. And you knocked on a door where there were two Democrats in the House and they told you they were voting for Trump. How did you not see that coming, is what I asked. But um, I think many incumbents outlived their expiration date, stayed too long, and didn't take the race seriously. I think the Senate Republican Campaign Committee also did not take many of these races seriously. There were people that lost on election night, like Senator Terrence Murphy, Annie Rabbit running to succeed Senator Vice, didn't even know they had any sort of trouble. They were swept out to sea. Some by only a few thousand votes. If they had just done a couple more mail pieces or you know done a little more get out the vote effort, perhaps we would have been in better stead. We can't let it get caught sleeping ever again. I mean, you know, as, as Erie County Chairman for a decade, um, you know, a little bit about Erie County. We're down two to one in You know, we have no business winning anything on paper. But we run, uh, you know, we triangular uh, message to, to the electorate where we take and talk about taxpayers. You know, you'll hear me constantly use the word taxpayer. It drives the other side nuts. But it also sends a signal back home that we care about the people that pay the bills. And we, we always did that in Erie County, and we won eight out of 10 countywide offices. We had no business winning by the numbers. But you know, we had to be smarter and more organized. And you know, we weren't better funded, but we, we were able to you know, figure out that. A lot of elections are won and lost with recruitment candidates. And that's why I'm very happy with some of the late decisions by people to enter races for the Senate. Some of them haven't even been publicly declared their candidates yet. But I think you'd be very pleasantly surprised by the totality of it. Uh, there's uh, more uh, cohesion between the Assembly, the Senate, and the party than there ever has been. We're working together and talking every single week about strategy in the election. The Senate Republican Campaign Committee has moved uh, their headquarters from independent space into 315 State Street, our townhouse in Albany. So we're all under one roof. So if you need to get a message, you just go up one flight of stairs. It's a great thing. But uh, we're working together, and uh, we have to be we have to be smarter and vigilant and, and be like a dog on a bone and never let up on the Thanks for coming. Oh, hello? Yeah. Yes. I think one of the main reasons Trump is now President Trump was he won close elections in states of Michigan, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Wisconsin. But yeah. And, and it really was he reached out to the people that thought they would be the other candidates did. I thought that made a big difference. I'm just saying, and I think a lot of the problems in New York is. There's a lot of infighting. Uh, I grew up on Long Island. You see it there, especially in the state. I think a lot of these people just need someone or the leadership like yourself just to come down and meet with them, as well as I think some of the other voters. Is there a plan at least to possibly do that next year or at least for the gubernatorial election? Because I believe if that's done, I think you could see a large turnout for the Republicans. Absolutely. I mean, not only are the issues on our side, and we're going to continue to make sure people remember things. And what, what happens in New York State politics is something crazy happens, and then everyone forgets, and we move on to the next crisis. But the party hasn't been there as a constant message on, you know, basically the trail of tears that Andrew Cuomo's left behind. And this is his legacy. Everything I say, this is Andrew Cuomo's Democrat Party. And that, that's every press conference I ever see. That is exactly how we'll talk. Any failure of our government is Andrew Cuomo's Democratic Party brought this to you. Uh, and in no more certainly than, than with this bill. We have not been had message discipline as a party. We have to be tough enough to fight back. Um, and, and you talk about pro-failure. I mean, and there's always that. Uh, one, one of the other things that I, I learned in my campaign for chairman is that, and I felt this as county chairman, but I always tried to reach and do more with the statewide candidates even if they didn't maybe have a shot, you know, maybe they had already been deemed, you know, they weren't contenders. But when someone stands up and puts their name forward for public office, I'm going to help them. And, and, and we, we have to, 
uh, when they come to Buffalo, we would roll out the red carpet and help them campaign, meet people, and do that. I know in some areas of the state that didn't happen. I heard that directly from the candidates. But what had, the, where our party had failed is that it became 62 fiefdoms rather than one united and strong statewide Republican Party. And it, it's a failing because people felt that I'm just focused on what I got going on here, and that's all I care about. I've got my 10 jobs at the Board of Elections, and, and this is important, and I've got a village trustee coming up next year. I mean, you hear the story time again. And, and listen, all politics are local. I am an old county chair at heart and always will be. I want to win every election we're in. But we need everyone to have skin in the game and understand, yeah, that's your piece of, of, of planet Earth that you're responsible for. And we need you for this big picture. And you're this little part of this painting that we have to do to paint a victory in 22. So I, I think we're starting to have breakthroughs as we're working closer with the county structures than we ever have been. Uh, you know, when I took over, obviously we didn't have uh, uh, a mint of money, but you know, we, we, we brought in a little at the beginning. You know, Chairman Cox was generous to, to leave some behind as well. Uh, but I said, all right, we're. Where can we make an impact in the 2019 local elections? I'm not going to buy a hand slide anywhere. I said, I said this, yeah, find me places where we're down one or two seats in a county board of supervisors, county legislature, you know, town board that means something to the future of the state. And we played in those areas. We didn't win them all, but I'm proud to say we flipped two counties from blue to red. Times to talk to people in some of my meetings down here as we're asking for money that it doesn't require uh, you know a million dollars to make a difference. The Clinton County Legislature. Now Clinton County, let me tell you what, that's a hike from anywhere. <laughs> you can't get there from here. Um, Clinton County is all of Plattsburgh, and you're closer to Montreal than you are to Albany in Clinton. Uh, that was one of those counties where. It's blue in enrollment, but this is Trump country. Wow. And you know when you're driving around, it's Trump country, and you can feel it, and you can touch it, and you know that they're just pissed at Andrew Cuomo. So I said, let's play in Clinton County. They're down two seats in that legislature. So how much do you think it costs to invest to win the Clinton County legislature? $5,000. Wow. $5,000. Most of our candidates for Congress spent that on bumper stickers. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but that made an impact, and now we have Republican government in that county. So I can't promise that we're going to make the city red. Um, but, you know, we are going to campaign and make a difference in this state everywhere. You got the whole show. I'm sort of the outsider here because thanks to my friend Jane who invited me. And uh, I do thank and thank you for coming. And I actually, I'm in the entertainment field as a singer. I actually sang for the inauguration of President George W. Bush. And I used to sing and I, um, I've sung, I used to sing for Mayor Giuliani a lot at Gracie Mansion. And I took a big chance, in a way, to come here tonight because even walking in the door, I met some of my fans that are very liberal. <laughs> they were walking in the door at the same time. So what I would like to say is this. I live in the smack in the heart of New York City, right near Times Square. I am appalled to see what is going on. I am also shocked at the, at the uh, mentality of why it's going on. Um, I believe that President Trump has an, has an understanding of the threat that can happen if Bernie Sanders is the candidate. Because yeah. in my opinion, yes. I keep hearing I'm, I'm not you know, totally entrenched yet in the Republican Party, and I am taking a chance because of my profession. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that the Republican Party is missing great opportunities of getting the messaging out properly. 
I would spend a lot of time, I have called Jane or we text on Facebook, when I see things that are disturbing, that are not being addressed, even in the building where I live, where they organized a bus to Pennsylvania to, to campaign against President Trump. Um, when I went to Barnes & Noble recently, and I actually spoke to the manager and I said, why is there a book display only about the impeachment against President Trump? And I found out that the manager hates, you know, they're liberal. Right. I see little things, but they're not little. They're not little. No, they're not. And I don't see people fighting back. And I get confused because I like a fair fight. I'm not saying, you know, I do believe that the people that are looking to uh, for this socialist government, they are not being heard properly. The message about why that is not a good thing is not being expressed properly. As far as the bail reform, when we say bail reform, the people that want bail reform, what do you call that, recoil? Because, but if you explain, like they just explained, that there was a French tourist that was slashed in the neck, and if you read more about it, the man that slashed him had done it three previous times and was let out of jail. He was not put in jail. And if you speak to the police officers, when I walk down the street in New York and there are trucks selling marijuana candy, and <coughs> I have called the police department. They are disgusted and disturbed. And I said, because their higher-ups are telling them they can't do anything. Right. And they also said, oh, there's nothing in there. It's only just candy. And, that. and you hear rap music with curse words. It's very upsetting. But then I said, think outside the box. They have not, they stopped giving subpoenas. What's the point? Because people don't show up. But then I said, think outside the box. They got Al Capone on income tax charges. I don't think we're, we're, we are thinking outside the box. We're not thinking outside the box. We need to understand the people that want a socialist government. It sounds really good to them to get everything for free. And I don't see the, the pushback. I, I would plant a lot of people in New York City, it's the microcosm of what is going on. The, the man, in the land of the blind, the man with one eye is king. The things that are going on here, I have fought when I have time and between my singing and I'm trying and I'm taking a stand and I should just be a singer, I suppose. But I have fought when I heard that, when I saw people homeless in the bus stops, moving furniture into the bus stops, well, elderly women with canes can't even sit in there. The children, they're walking over. There's human feces on the street. And, but beyond all of that, beyond all of that, and a police officer confirmed it, when they allow this kind of what they call compassion, what is compassion? Right. What about my compassion? What about my, my right to walk down a street that's clean and safe? What the, this is a perfect Sorry. chance to plant a dirty bomb in one of the suitcases. Uh, and I thought about this and other, <laughs> the community board was upstairs. I said, why don't you just come downstairs? Said, what are you talking about? I said, of course you don't care because you have paid vacations. Please, I can go on and on as you hear me. <laughs> I live in New York City. I see the insanity that is going on. But what I don't see, I called Gerald Nadler's office about three years ago because I know a Canadian citizen who has Medicaid, a subsidized apartment in the middle of New York City in a prime location, food stamps, and she's a filmmaker, and, and refused employment that I was going to give her. It wasn't a big, huge job and was nasty. I called Gerald Nadler's office, not, not, I just wanted to understand under what statute that was allowed, under which United States law that could be possible. Someone who answered the phone started to attack me and said, you cannot be against immigrants. My grandparents came from Italy. They did it properly. They, I do not understand why we don't have five facts, 10 facts. They're making it sound 
like no one was ever turned away from this country, and that is not true. 